Today we have João Nunes here on the Gustavo Rubino Ernesto channel. Welcome, João. Thank you for the interview. Thank you for the opportunity. Why did you become an ESL teacher? Yeah, so um, basically um, I finished my master's degree in linguistics. I heard great course, great course, great people. I heard, I heard that too, coincidentally, yeah. And um, yeah, the, um, the job search was a bit complicated, you know, um, PhDs are uh, scarce and they're not always what you want specifically. Uh, I wanted to deal with phonetics and phonology, so the sounds of the English language. And there wasn't much offer, honestly. And so instead of just me being at home and uh, staying at home looking for jobs, I tried to diversify my curriculum. And with the level of English that I have, um, I thought that it might be a good thing to teach English. Um, I, yeah, I, um, I had this sort of um, motivation to do something with the English language. And so um, I decided to become a teacher. Yeah. All right. Sounds great. But how did you get started? Which course did you go to? Well, how did that yeah. happen? So in the beginning, I, uh, I looked online what type of courses uh, people usually ask in international schools or private schools. And they're usually the TEFL, the TESOL, and the CELTA course. Um, and in my online search, I sort of gravitated towards the CELTA course because from what I gathered, um, it was the most prestigious one. It was also the most expensive one. It's the one that is most widely accepted in in worldwide. And so in terms of um, my chances of becoming an actual teacher after the uh, the course, I decided to do the CELTA course uh, yeah. through, through the International House in Lisbon. Because of the pandemic, of course, I had to do it online. Yeah. And uh, getting to that note, you said worldwide, but how is the situation of ESL teaching in Portugal right now? Or how do you see the situation? Uh, right now, everything is gravitating towards online settings. Um, in terms of the quality of the ESL teaching, um, my personal experience and from what I, I understand of people who go through public schools is that in public schools, uh, it is, if you are a brilliant student and you are really motivated, it's, it's fine. The, the, they, they teach you appropriately, of course. Um, everything is, is state-sponsored. But private schools can offer you a sort of attention that um, public schools just can't deal with. So you can have tutoring, you can have... Um, the, the classes the, the classes are smaller the materials provided are much better because they they are they are made by Cambridge and Oxford so these are institutions that do these materials and do these evaluations and exams already very well established so I would say that yeah public schools are okay but of course the the private schools are much better in terms of the, the private language schools, not private schools, private language schools specifically, uh, um, are a bit better yeah, in that regard in teaching. And I think that the screening towards the teachers might be also a little bit better. So the quality of the teachers also can be, uh, yeah, a bit better. Would you say they're younger on language centers than <clears throat> they are in public schools? I had that problem when I started. I saw that, that uh, they were younger, they were motivated, they wanted to learn new things or new methods. While in public school, you know, the old rag mm. or someone that said the verb to be for five years. De definitely. Um, I wouldn't say that it's only old people teaching in public schools, though. Um, but uh, if, you, if you don't... Um, go through a bachelor of studies in education, you can't go to a public school. So what happens is in my, for example, me, I'm, I, th I, I am pretty sure I can teach in a public school skills wise, but they would never allow me to do that because you have to go through the university, the, um, the university project uh, of education and maybe a master's degree in education. And so 
the field of choice of teachers in the public schools, I would say, is much thinner. So in, in private language schools, you can just go to people who do the CELTA course, which, uh, which is a, a big number, and it doesn't, need, it doesn't even need to be a Portuguese uh, teacher. So I would say that in a public school, I don't know if it's possible even for a native speaker to be a, a public school teacher. Maybe, I, I'm not sure. But in private language schools, you see them all the time. You see people, uh, native speakers of English, speakers of other languages who speak very good English, uh, teaching there so there's more variety of teachers uh, the teachers like you say are usually younger early 30s uh, you see more of those types in private language schools so all of that um, kind of works in favor of, of private language schools I would it say. is interesting because I see myself as a teacher who could teach anywhere but then mm -hmm. when you come to bureaucracy which is only pure bureaucracy this is unions saying oh you need to have this qualification that qualification and when you have all that you teach worse your quality of teaching is worse than the ones they're doing in the language centers it amazes me but you did mention Cambridge and Oxford mm -hmm. do you have a favorite ESL method um not particularly particularly a favorite one. Um, I like several ones. Uh, the, the, for me, and this is my way of thinking, I like structure a lot. I like to have everything structured. So the structural approach to teaching English, for example, where you have to teach the verb to be before you teach the present continuous, because the present continuous um, mandates that there is a, an auxiliary verb in, in the verb to be. These sort of structures, I think, for me, helps me teach, helps me understand, and I think it helps the students understand a bit better the context in which they're, they're learning the language. Okay. Um, I also like the communicative language teaching. So this approach kind of gears the students towards a, 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 a way of learning language through communication. And I think that is very important. Um, uh, I, I have a student in the, in, a, in the beginner level, A1, pure, pure beginner, and we started with that. We started, I didn't start the classes by teaching the verb to be, or the, the verb have, or the verb to do. I started with pres presenting yourself to other people. So, uh, what's your name? Uh, oh, nice to meet you. Uh, how are you? So, uh, from the get-go, in a beginner level, we kind of teach the student how to introduce themselves, how to um, say their name, ask the other person's name, introduce a third person to the conversation, or what's his name or her name. And you, you in, in these simple conversations, you already have questions with what, you have questions, uh, you have um, uh, the verb to be, I am, or what is your name, you have uh, possessive adjectives, you have all sorts of different things only through a pure communicative approach, right? And uh, how old is this student? This student is uh, 17. 17. Okay. So she already went through the public school, but um, yeah, I mean, start from the get, start from the beginning, uh, just do all the courses in English so you can have the best uh, type of English that you can, you can learn, yeah. Also, another another um, approach that I like, another method is the task-based learning. So that is very um, relevant in order to, like, I like the fact that you can give a student a task that they find interesting to complete because it motivates them to learn uh, to learn English in a way that um, if you have any sort of grammar to learn. And you don't teach. I don't think you should teach the student in a in a very boring way. You should you should prepare them, and you should put exercises in front of them or tasks that they f they can find themselves in that exercise. They can extrapolate from that exercise into the real world. So that that I think. It's it's very important a relevance of the exercises in uh, in, uh, in in the current world, I guess. Um, yeah, basically being relevant to the students. You you can't teach adults, fifty year olds or sixty year olds, 
based on children's books, right? Because it's not very interesting. You should teach them, like I had in my CELTA course, I had I, I, I taught adults in their 50s, 60s, and even 70s. And of course, like some of the things were, um, some, of the, some of the lessons were gravitated towards newspapers and news and things that they can maybe perhaps engage themselves more, more with, with more motivation. Uh, I, I wouldn't give them exercises that would be geared towards uh, teenagers, for example, where you talk about, I don't know, sports or something that, I mean, it's not that the adults don't interest themselves in sports, but it's that it's more relevant to, to teenagers because they, they are surrounded with sport during their teenage years. Yeah, I completely agree. And in that note that you explain all the different students that you have and the different materials, what are the essential qualities you think an ESL teacher should have? Um, for me, it would be, first of all, patience. That is, that is something that I had to learn because when I start, actually, this is a, this is something that I like to, to talk about because I mean, it's relevant to me because I, I I always thought that I was very impatient and I was very impatient. I, I didn't have patience to teach people. And when people didn't understand something that I said, I would uh, I would lose interest in the conversation because they're not keeping up, right? So I was very impatient and I learned to be patient. And the feedback that I got during the course was that I was very patient. I was very surprised with that. So patience is definitely one of them. You have to be prepared to... Um, to dump down everything, um, even if it seems ridiculous to you. Also something that I think it's important is, of course, motivation to do something uh, is also, I think, very, very relevant. Uh, if you're, if you, I think you, we all know about the, like you said, the old public school teacher who's, who's fed up of teaching students, whether it's from seventh grade or 12th grade, it, I don't think they're very motivated at all sometimes, and th that reflects in the quality of the of the of the lesson. Uh, so motivation would be something that you you would have to have to be a teacher because if you don't have it, it the, the the quality of the classes will definitely decline. And uh, yeah, yeah, I just thinking. Mm -hmm. Which other characteristics marks you? Because patience is something that every teacher says straight away. Mm. But I remember that my father, when I started in the profession, he said, there are two things that you have to understand as a teacher. Humility, you have mm. to be modest. I'm mm. definitely not as a person, <laughs> but in the classroom, absolutely. Yeah. And you have to explain things like they are five years old. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's a CEO, a CFO, you have to explain as a five-year-old. And it works. It yeah. really works. Humility is a very good point. Actually, the um, the the owner of the private language school that I teach at, he said that, and I completely agree that you have to be prepared to admit your mistakes. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's very important. Um, if I make a mistake in a class and I notice it, I will, I will absolutely bring it up in the next class and say, sorry, this is, this was wrong. This is the correct way. Let's make sure you understand that this is the correct way. Uh, so humility is very important. You, you can't be an arrogant teacher because it, it will go it will go south very fast. I think. And I think the students like when you don't know something. I have noticed like mm. a couple of times mm. they ask me a question, uh, uh, what the, the meaning of that word, and I go like, oh, all right, uh, that one is a doozy. Then I have mm -hmm. to check it out and bring in the next class. They go like, whoa. Yeah. You don't know that one. Good. That, that's good. I like it. Yeah, it, it, show, it shows that even a teacher ha learns every day some, something new every day in, in the language. So it, it, does, it, it, it might make the students feel like what they're going through is, is normal, which it is, of course. Okay. Also, something that I think is essential, and I think it's very obvious, but it, it, I think sometimes I'm a bit flabbergasted by the things that I see that is you have to have a very good command of the language that you're teaching. So, for example, I have B2 level of German, and I was I was proposed to teach German classes. Uh, no, so I, that wouldn't what, what, work. <laughs> what happened was, I think that I would be able to teach the basic beginner of German, but it would never be to the same standard of 
my English classes, it would never be able to, to be in the same level. And because of that, I just plainly refused. Until I have a solid and confident command of the language, I would never be able to, to feel comfortable teaching, teaching German, for example. And what I see sometimes with English teachers is that this is from my very small, very, very small experience that I have, is that sometimes, like, I don't know, uh, teachers, they don't, they can't explain themselves very well. Um, they, they sometimes get lost in their own words and explanations. And I mean, it happens to everyone. Of course it does. But when it, it when it becomes a bit frequent, um, I don't know, sometimes I feel like it should be said that you, you have, it's not only a basic C1 that you need to have to teach a language. That's what I'm saying, basically. Yeah. You have to have above C1, whatever that is. C2 usually refers to native speakers, and I don't believe that it's it's almost impossible to get to native speak, but that's another conversation. Uh, it, you have to have a better than a basic C1. Like, you, if you, if you pass a grade in a C1 level class, I don't think you're right then and there, you are immediately ready to teach a class. Maybe why if you are a brilliant student, the brilliant students are always capable of doing something that the average student doesn't. Um, but yeah, that, that, that would be something that I recommend. Fiercely. So you wouldn't see, because I have the firm belief that a teacher should speak the student's L1. I truly believe in mm. that. I, I think it makes a whole difference. And my next question would go on that one. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that using only English would help mm -hmm. students learn the language easily? Uh, so I think it is very important that you have the students L1 because it, 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 if, if, if things go south, um, I think you should be able to explain it in their native language. However, Having a native speaker of English or a person who only speaks, literally only speaks English, that was my German classes in university. The, 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 the teacher, the professor, she knew Portuguese. She had a C1 command of Portuguese easily. Of course, she had a thick accent, a thick German accent, but it was, it was I, she, she could have a bureaucracy to talk easily in Portuguese, but she never spoke uh, Portuguese in class. Never, not even... She dumped down a lot of stuff. Even if you didn't understand, she would dump down. And if you didn't understand, well, tough luck. Just, <laughs> just, just go to the dictionary. Try to find context to understand that word. But I will not speak Portuguese. Never, never. We would speak among each other in the class, of course. But she would never speak Portuguese. And I think that is very important. It 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 gives the students more exposure to the language, of course. Uh, which in turn uh, helps the student acquire the language a, a bit more easily. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. It is very important to uh, to leave the native language out the door when you enter the classroom. Just use the English language. That is the mindset of the school that I teach. Once you enter the school grounds, not even the class, the school grounds, it's English from then on. And if you're if you if you're learning another language and you find the teacher in the hallway, you speak in that language, not in your native language. Yeah. So, so it's that, very important. So that we'll go to the next question, which would mm -hmm. be: Which language should teachers use while giving instructions? Even grammar. Would you go like a, a perfect present? You wouldn't teach in L one. You no. go straight to L two. No, no. I would I would give the students uh, the instructions in, in, for example, for exercises. Obviously, instructions in 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 the in L two, and in in teaching grammar, I would teach everything as well in English. Um, for example, teaching a, a present perfect, it would start with context. All of it is is within context. A text that uses present perfect, for example, then introduce the rule, and then introduce exercises, something like that. Very basic. That would all have to be in, in English, of course. For example, I have a beginner student. I don't, I always speak in English, but I, I kind of get it, get, I can see when she doesn't understand something. So I know that there are some parts that I will, I will, I will tell in Portuguese. I will say in Portuguese. I have no problem with that because I think it's a hindrance if I keep speaking English and she doesn't understand what's going on. I think it's, I, I, I prefer to say a sentence in English, repeat it in Portuguese, and hope that um, doing that, she understands that 
what I'm saying in Portuguese is literally the same that I'm saying in English. So I do that often so that it becomes apparent. Um, and it can, it, it, it sort of works because some of the things that I say, said in English and in Portuguese in the past, now I only need to say it in English and she doesn't even look puzzled, you know? So maybe, you know, like, let's listen very carefully to what's, to the conversation. Like this in the beginning, I said it in Portuguese, but now it's 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 useless because she already knows. Okay, it's listening. It's a listening exercise. I have to listen carefully, even if she doesn't know the translation perfectly of carefully. She knows that it's with attention, paying attention, or something like that. So, yeah, um, all, all the time as much as possible in English, uh, in in a certain level. I think from B one only in the only in the language. Uh, I have also an intermediate student, never speak in Portuguese. I never speak in Portuguese. Um, even if he doesn't understand a word, I will uh, explain it. If he does, still doesn't understand, I'll give the definition. Mm. I will always dumb down and explain as if they're they're five years old. After a certain level, I think you have to ditch completely the native language. Yeah. I would agree with the advanced, <laughs> absolutely. It's a little bit like, you know, but I would agree in part with the first statement that you said on the grounds only English or Portuguese because they that might disencourage students to ask. I would mm. think so. But it's own experience. I saw that a couple of times and I said, okay, I know that guy wants something, but oh, what can I do? I'm, I'm just a teacher sometimes. And in mm. that note, leaving the students or trying to understand, uh, do you think students can be conditioned to acquire English language or the English language skills through repetition and positive or negative reinforcement? And negative reinforcement, I mean, the ones accepted today, nowadays, better. Yeah, um, regarding repetition, um, I think that it, repetition is very good for pronunciation. Uh, uh, when When my students can't pronounce a word very well, I stop them, I repeat the word and I tell them to repeat after me two or three times. Um, that's something that I, I often do because I, pronunciation isn't completely necessary in order for communication to be had. But I think it's something, I think it's something very important regardless. Um, I don't want my students to go to another country and pronounce words in English completely wrong and either not be understood or be mocked by it. And I mean, it's just not pleasant. I think it's better to have a good pronunciation and I do that with repetition. Um, but how about when the students can't get the TH to come uh, out? Mm, well, I don't know for other speakers of other languages. For Portuguese, I have a very good, um, okay. a very, a very good uh, tactic, which is saying uh, supinha de massa but as if you had a lisp, so you would say Fupinha de Matha. <laughs> so that usually my, my students kind of look at me as if I'm mocking them, yeah. if I'm making fun of them, but it, it, is, it is really not because uh, that lisp in Portuguese is quite, quite common. Uh, if you have a lisp, that, that, that type of lisp is very common, the th instead of s. Um, and it's something that I think if you, if you go to a, to a school, in your during your life, you will you will hear someone speaking like that. I did fairly often, and every Portuguese speaker knows that. And uh, so it is something that we don't have that sound in our language, but um, we can bridge that gap by by giving them a, a, a real example of a real word example. And usually it works. Yeah, Mister, um, I'm teaching one that is a Spanish native speaker. Mm -hmm. And I have to speak Spanish, and my Spanish is not perfect at all. Mm -hmm. But then there is no way that th does not come out. <laughs> it doesn't work throughout. It was in, it, forget about it. But she went with f. I mm. tried some of the the strong accents in Spanish. I saw some people in the online f. If they go with fru, I'm fine by that. But uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, the student gets too frustrated and it stops the learning process. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some some. I think there are some American dialects where you can have the f sound instead of the th sound. So they're not completely wrong. 
it's not completely wrong. But yeah, um, you have to be careful when um, trying not to frustrate the students with something that they can't accomplish. I usually, when I do the, the TH sound, I just tell them that, practice and move on. Uh, during the classes, next the, the, the next classes, if I hear something, I will correct it and I will remind them, but I won't, I won't stick to it um, uh, very strongly. I don't think that's, that's good. It, it halts the process of learning, I believe. And how about the positive reinforcements? Do you give them a compliment? Do you yeah. Uh, I have zero experience with negative reinforcement, but with positive reinforcement, I haven't tried the negative reinforcements yet. <laughs> Um, but the uh, positive, maybe when you start teaching in public yeah. school. <laughs> yeah, the positive info, I, I, I try my best. It's um, it, during some exercise, whatever the exercise is about, um, I always, if they do everything correct, I'm like, perfect, that was awesome, very good. Like, I, I can't, for example, give them uh, like a... Like I don't know if you did this in school, but when you did like a, a writing a writing assignment in uh, in school, in English specifically, um, they they would give you back the writing assignment with, uh, with the written assignment with a a little star or a sticker or okay. something like that. Yeah. I mean, I don't have the opportunity right now because we're in an online setting, so every every reinforcement that I have to give is verbal. But I always do either. I do the very good, perfect, that was very good, you did very well. Or I I like to, especially with the, my beginner student, I like to, to contextualize her situation right now because she always says, oh, I, I don't understand this or something because she misses one exercise or whatever. And I always tell her to look back, look where you were two months ago, getting introduced to English and look at where you are now. Uh, talking about the routine, the day, the daily routine. It's it's a huge step, and if students understand that 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 progression, I, I think it motivates them even further. So I always try to contextualize where they are right now. It's harder with um, higher levels of English, of course, because the progress is not as um, stark. So um, I don't know how do you measure the progress of a C1 student? It, it's quite hard. It's you are a fluent. Do you, do you, you or do you count books? I would yeah, count like books. you are a fluent speaker, and the only thing is you're getting even more fluent. But it's not as it's not as oh look, you didn't know the past simple, and now you know. It's it's <laughs> it's not the same. It's much harder to to account for progress. You just you just get more complex, and it, that's much harder to to pinpoint where the progress is or where the progress is currently. So. Uh, in a beginner setting, I always I always try to motivate them by looking back and look at where you are now and look at think about where you will be in a year of studying English. You will be much much better. So this small exercise that you didn't know the verb or you didn't know which was the correct pronoun, don't worry, it it, it all comes with time. Yeah, that's true. Uh, on negative reinforcement, you never used. I no. had one experience that stopped me. So I was teaching back home. In a classroom, 20 students, eighth grade. Uh, one student was struggling with pronunciation, the other made fun. I spoke to the one who made fun in Swedish. And mm. I asked him, so you think you're smart as then? Could you answer my question in Swedish? By the way, I said, uh, my shoes are blue in Swedish, something like that. <laughs> and uh, years passed, years, years passed. And this student got to me to Facebook and he said, Tish, thank you for the humility lesson. I needed that one. I still keep it in my mind. The guy's finishing university now, so that makes two things. It worked, and I'm getting old. Mm, so yeah, yeah. it hurts. Yeah. Time so, never stops. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately. But let's go. In your experience, can students' mistakes be predicted? Um, if I'm teaching my my uh, a native speaker of my language, yes, I can predict what types of words they will have problem pronouncing. I can predict whether they will have more trouble with certain words. Uh, false friends come to mind immediately, like library, it's not literally, it's, it's completely different. Um, in, it is limited, but to a certain degree, yes. You, you, you can predict uh, students' mistakes and you should be able to predict mistakes because I think when you prepare a lesson, it doesn't need to be in too much depth, but when you prepare a lesson, 
and you have, for example, a reading uh, exercise that you're going to do, and you're going to read like five paragraphs, I think you should go through the text yourself as a teacher and, and kind of try to predict where the student will have trouble. Does he know this word? Does he know this word? If he doesn't know, how am I going to explain it in the best way I can? Um, is he going to understand the context of the text? How can I, can I simplify the text in order for them to, to be able to, to understand it better? All of those things uh, should be kept in mind in the teacher's, in the teacher's mind, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I believe that the students can, mistakes can be predicted, of course. Yeah. And let's talk about the participation of those students in class. Do you think they'd be, they sh the teachers should actively encourage their participation? Yeah, yeah, that, that definitely. Yeah. Like, yeah. Not only is it good for the student, it's good for the teacher as well in the class because it, it, it moves the class forward. Um, if you are in a class where you have to wait each time 10 to 15 seconds for someone to answer, it's not going to be a very fun class to teach and it's not going to be fun to teach and to 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 learn. It, it, it's, it's not good. So, uh, I mean, you, you can talk about ways of getting the students comfortable in the classroom and whatnot, um, but uh, you should try, I think it's also your responsibility as a teacher to pick things that engages the students, the, the students the best to the best of their abilities. Like where we were talking about motivation in the in, in a few minutes few minutes ago, um, to 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 and about the tasks the the tasks that you put to your students. It is important that they're relevant because of that as well, because it encourages participation. Um, you can't just uh, expect the best student to always participate because otherwise, how are you going to evaluate your students? How are you going to have a mental image of every student? Like, If a student doesn't participate, I don't know what type of progress they are, they are currently ongoing. Um, I can't know if he understood it well. Not only is it important for the students to answer the exercises, but also come up with questions and tell tell them them telling us questions, uh, asking questions about either the um, the exercises that we're doing or the topics that we're, we're we're facing, so that yeah, there's more engagement from the part of the students. Sure. And uh, you already answered sort of this question, but I want to straight away point. Do you think students should be given the definitions rather than figure them out, the words to figure themselves out? What's the the meaning of the word? Or mm, um, I don't think they should be given the dictionary definition from the get go. No, I don't okay. think they should. Uh, I, I don't understand this word. Okay, this word means da 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 da. da. I, I would prefer to. For example, if they're reading a text and they don't understand the word, I would first tell them to look at what's around the word. What 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 is the sentence that comes before that sentence? What is the sentence that comes before? And through the context, can you understand um, what the word means? Oh, it's maybe this or that. Okay, you're close. Uh, so let's dump it down a bit. And I, I it's sort of <laughs> it's almost like you're a psychologist because a psychologist doesn't tell you the answer. The psychologist just <laughs> Just moves uh, helps you, to... you find your way. Exactly, and that's what I, that's that's my approach. If okay. if all else fails, of course I will have to give the definition and even the translation, depending on the level, of course. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, okay, I I think it's different ways sometimes when you give because I want the class and the student to have more contact. So I would give the definition if in such <coughs> matters, but I'll dump down to one thing. You know, I'm a big I'm a big fan of the history of English. So sometimes I go to the students like, do you think this is German or is this Latin? Or this mm. is a little bit French. And they when they's Latin, and I'm teaching of course Spaniards or Brazilians or Portuguese or whoever, it is really easy. They really mm. get to the point. When it's German words, oh by Lord. What, what, don't they go crazy on trying to figure out what swim mm. is sometimes? But yeah. uh, what I got once was a skiing. Swimming was the same as skiing. Okay. I'm not going to forget that one. But I, I see the similarities and then you have false friends. I don't know. It's just about yeah. moving the class. I don't know. It's something. But in that note, mm -hmm. do you think students should uh, be, uh, should this focus be on communication in the classroom? Um. 
Y yes, to, to a certain degree, yes. Like I said in the in the ESL methods, I, I mentioned the the communicative language teaching. So I think it's important for several different reasons. First, I think if the students see something that is relevant uh, to the to, to to the real world, like if you, it's not like maths where where are you going to use algebra? Yeah, I mean. If it, it's not, unless it's something very specific, it, it's it, it kind of it's kind of abstract, right? So you kind of have to 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 teach them a bit of a bit of things in 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 a way that it's a, a real world context. So I I would say that, like I said, the the first classes of the beginner student that I have with the introductions and um, asking the name and how are you and what not. She could already be prepared to, I mean, at least engage in 30 seconds of conversation from the first few classes. And that is very important because not only it's important when they go out and they speak English, but it's also in the classroom, they, f they might feel a bit more engaged, that it's more relevant, it's more important to be learning this instead of tables with rules and grammar and whatnot, because that's boring, everyone thinks that's boring because that's not the, the, the way that it's appropriately taught. Uh, I don't think at least that it's, it's appropriate to teach that way. Uh, if, if you do it in a, in, a, in a context of using it in the real world, I think it's, it's much better. And communication is, is, is vital to that. I and and that, that's the context I want to ask you now. Do you think language should be taught in context? Should you give mm, a text? Mm. Oh, yeah, okay. Always, yeah, always, always. You always have to, um, especially, I, I think that the most important thing to teach in context is grammar, because usually it's it, it's not because scientifically it's the hardest, but it's be, it's the one that students hate the most because they only think of rules and, and and tables and whatnot. And if you teach them, I don't know, you, you're teaching the past continuous and you show an ex uh, an extract of a story that uses like a paragraph of a story in. Uh, uh, in that uses the past continuous several times. I mean, you can use that. It, it's a story. It's something that it's it's real. It, it, it's an actual story, a book, whatever the size of it is, and uh, it, it, it can motivate the students to to it. I think it definitely does motivate the students to 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 be more motivated to to learn the language because if you teach them things in a, an abstract way, you're going to lose them very fast. I I believe. And it's true. Uh, I don't remember most of the words that I learned in, at home with, uh, in German. Forget it. If there are no mm. contacts, you just don't. And let's go to my favorite question. And one of the last one, but my favorite. Do you think verbs are the central focus of language? Uh, maybe. I mean, verbs are extremely important. They convey the the information, the events, the actions, whatever it is from a from a a set of words that we call sentences. Um, yeah, like uh, verbs are incredibly important, but I think it's important to give them context around them uh, as well. Again, as, as with everything, um, I don't know. Um, yeah, w w one of the classes that I had, uh, I was teaching common verbs. So have, live, work, love, and I just didn't present the verbs, gave them a couple of sentence, example sentences and the conjugation and that was it. I gave them within a text. So within this text, you're going to listen to the verbs, you're going to be aware of them, and then we're going to talk about them after we've seen the verbs being used within a, within a specific context. Um, and I didn't even need to translate any of the verbs from the students from a beginner student from the get-go, she listened to the text, she read the text, and it was a fill in the blanks with the verbs, and she didn't even need to, to be tr to, for me to translate the verbs because from the context of the sentences and the context of the text, she understood it quite, quite easily. It was very good. That's fair. So, I, would, so, I would have done the sentence before, then the text together. I Sorry, I would have done a sentence before and then show the text. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. just okay, one yeah. sentence, just to get the hint of it, and then you yeah. go to the text. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt uh, you. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, I was just adding that verbs can be, a, a, of course, a, a focus of the language. I don't know if I would call it central. 
I think for cavalry, it's also extremely important. Like, it's, I mean, everything's important in language, I guess, but um, vocabulary and verbs, I think, would be my main choices, yeah. Definitely. Okay, and you mentioned before the average age that you get uh, that you're teaching. So sometimes <clears> you get a 70 year old, sometimes you get a 17 year old. Oh, Do you yeah. believe that there is a window of time and age in which a person can learn a language? Uh, short answer: No, I don't think there is a time. Uh, I, I, okay. So there is a caveat to that answer, of course. So. In my in my CELTA course, I taught only adults. I had 10, 12 students. Only one was 35, 40. The other ones were from 50, ranged from 50 to 72. And they all had started in their 50s, at least. Like the 55 year olds started at 50, the 72 year olds started at 65, 66. They all had four or five years of learning and they all started after 50 years old. And some of the English that I heard from them was unbelievably good. So people who had very, very little contact with English in their youth and in their growing years, in their adult years, uh, they, they, they had very good pronunciation. They had very good use of English. Um, they, they used the words appropriately. They didn't formulate uh, nonsensical sentences. They, they had very, very good command. However, I think it, the, the earlier you start learning a language, the better it is to acquire it. Because um, if you start learning a language at four years old, when you are 18, which in worldwide is average for when you become an adult, legally an adult, you would have more than 10 years of experience in a language, which once you get out in the adult world, you already have more than a decade of experience with a language that will help you communicate with everyone else in the world. So if a 50 year old starts learning today and after 10 years, you're 60, okay. But what kind of uh, utility will you have in the language? Reading, news, uh, visiting other places. But for a 18 year old, I think it's a much more prevalent thing. You, you can find a job, you can find your wife or husband, you can live in another country, you can do your whole, whole adult life in another country because you learn the language so early in your life. But that, that, so, doesn't that matter with motivation? Because what's the motivation of a 60-year-old and an 18-year-old? As you said, as an 18-year-old, he's looking for a wife, she's looking for a... I <laughs> yeah. don't know what their motivation is, but at the, 50, the you're student, a bit tired, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. And the thing that surprised me the most was were these 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds, and 70-year-olds when I taught that what was their motivation, right? So many of them was they wanted to hear the BBT. They wanted to hear the news out from the outside world without being in the public Portuguese television. Nobody deserves that. And, and a lot of them wanted to read books. So if you think about it, excuse me, a 50 year old, it makes sense that they read more, at least in, in, a, in a physical way, the paper and whatnot, and they read more books. And so, for most of them, the motivation for learning English was to be able to listen to the news, uh, not only listen, read, also the New York Times, the Telegraph, um, whatever it is, and to read books um, from in English. Yeah, so it, it was it was kind of surprising because, like you said, what is like after fifty, you learn a language. I mean, you can love languages, and and that's your hobby. There are plenty of people yeah. like that, right. yeah. um, but it, it, it interested me. I would never think of a 50 year old to learn a language, to read a book, for example, or to read news or, or whatever. So yeah, it was, I guess it, it, it's up to each person, but there is it, definitely, there is definitely motivation to be had, even if you're yeah. older. I would agree, but don't you think like sometimes I feel like English is so present in everyday life mm -hmm. that it becomes more like, oh, I need this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Th this sort of, uh, we have it in Portuguese, a good old saying, I don't know if you have in Portugal, mm -hmm. but it's when the water 
hits your butt, buddy. It's time to start to learn swimming. I, uh, okay, I don't know that. I don't know that. You uh, know that, that idiom. It sounds very interesting. Um, it, it's very Brazilian. It's very Brazilian. Yeah, uh, I, I guess when the, when those older students said they wanted to listen to the news, I, I guess that's something that they felt the need to. Like um, uh, one of them had uh, their children, which were already adults, even older than me were living abroad in England and whatnot. So there is that necessity if you want to communicate with your family or a part of your family. Like if, if your son, if, if, your, if your children are abroad in England and they have kids, how are you going to communicate with your grandchildren? Of course, you have the native language of the parents, but if you learn the language that, that the, the children, the grandchildren know, and in this case is English, which is awesome because everyone speaks English or almost everyone speaks English, yeah. And then I'm going to go, as with you had the example from England, let's go to that one. Do you think that is better to, for students to learn in an immersive con environment or context? Um, it, the, Remind you that I know that you lived in Germany. Yes, okay, yeah. and, I, and, and my thesis was pertained to immerse, immersion mm -hmm. programs. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, this went back to a question that you asked me about yeah using the l2 only okay yeah. yeah because yes i think it's if we're talking about reaching the best of best levels of language it is much better to learn in an immersive environment so um an immersion program like they have there in germany where if you're in a german english school 50 percent of the time is you are taught in German and the other 50% is in English, the students will inevitably acquire a much better grasp of language much earlier. Um, if you learn, if you're not in an, if you're in a mainstream program and you start learning English at six years old and you finish high school at 18 or 17 and you had English all those years, I would gander that a student that learned in an immersion program can achieve that in quite a shorter amount. Oh, two of time. years. Oh, two years. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's, I mean, it is obvious, but it has to be proven. And it is proven that it, it is, that, I mean, I don't know if it is proven uh, actually. Don't I quote, have, me, I don't quote some, me on that. Papers are, they're not. Don't Still. quote me on that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I, I would bet, I would bet easily money that after. I don't know, five to seven years in an immersion program, you speak better than a, a student that learned for 12 years in the mainstream program. I would bet on that because the exposure is so huge. Compare, if but you have... Exposure, exposure with uh, teaching. Yeah. You yeah. have to be taught because just yeah, yeah. exposure exactly. by itself doesn't work. For example, um, just think about it. If you have 20 hours of classes per week and 10 hours are in English, compare that to the general mainstream program. I don't know how it is in Germany, but I bet it's the same in Portugal. You have two classes of two hours of English per week. Pretty much I would, Yeah, I, I would bet that, yeah. So you have four hours against 10 per week. After a year, that's, I don't know how much is that. It, it's already, it's tens of hours more of input and exposure and dealing with the language in a whole different level. Yeah, And you and have different contexts. Also, mm -hmm. because you have yeah. language in sorry in math in biology and so no, many no. Other uh, in, in germany in germany math and german are taught in german the rest is in english because math is really important to be touched in one specific oh, and, language and, 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 and religion religion is also taught in german the rest everything else is in english and but it's it, not history one part of history no. i thought it was also from, in german. from the from the program that i read uh, i didn't read the law because my german is not that good but um, from the program that I read, it was 50% German. That includes math, religion, and German language. And the rest is in, in English. Oh. Um, and I mean, it's, it's self-explanatory, Have having doubled the exposure. And usually these immersion programs, I don't know how often, but I would bet that they have native speakers of English much more often than the public schools. So that is also an added plus. Plus bureaucracy. So, and also, it's better. You, it's better if you have if you have a native speaker. Even if your English is perfect as a non-native speaker, a native speaker will always be better because I mean, it's it's their language.
Yeah. That's true. But not on the explanations. I can go with a little bit of the explanations. But yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The numbers. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a main question right now for those who are ESL teaching nowadays in Cambodia and are thinking, oh my God, why is this so important? Why is English so important? What is so important to learn English? Right now, as of 2021, English is the most widely spoken language and the adopted language for communicating with speakers of different languages. Maybe in 50 years, everyone will be speaking Mandarin. We I don't, don't know. know. <laughs> we don't know. No. But for now, if you want to leave your country, if you're not a native speaker, of course, of English, if you want to leave your country and you want to visit other people and you want to live abroad and you want to work abroad, you have to have English period I don't think I don't think it is a choice unless you in unless you're from Spain and you go to work for a 100% Spanish company in Germany and everyone speaks Spanish even then I would say English is important because I mean you you could be working in a Spanish environment and but you're still living in a German one and you would have to speak with the German people so English is incredibly vital nowadays and it's good because I teach English, so everyone needs it. So it, it, it's 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 perfect, perfect situation for now. But uh, do, would you defend the language as an easy one when I say like important? For me, it's very important when I see when I learn German or when I analyze Portuguese or Spanish. It goes a little bit off on me. It's just because why yeah. in English is so much easier. Why are mm. we going through the same so much trouble to say exactly the same thing? Yeah. Uh, First of all, it's easier for us because we've already have at least what two decades of English on our shoulders. So it's easy. Of course, I say it's easy English, but uh, it all depends, of course, where where you come from um, sure. and uh, how much you learn. And like in terms of um, in public school or private language school, I would say those are different. Um, I would say if you expose yourself to the language outside of the classroom, uh, movies, books, whatever it is, if you're motivated to learn all of those things. It, it, for us in Europe, one of the most difficult languages is either Chinese or Japanese because it's so out there with the writing and the intonation and whatnot. If you are motivated enough, you you are going to learn the language. You, you only You don't learn the language only if you if you if you want to learn a few sentences just to tell just to say that you you can speak this language but you don't speak the language of course mm. um but yeah but i'm guessing I mean, like people are getting lazy once they speak english i heard like mm. even myself sometimes i just go like mm, okay it's a worth of it's not worth my time learning this much mm. i have to because i'm in a different condition right now but sometimes i just see people coming to to germany and Volkswagen last year made last year or two years ago, I don't remember, made English its official language. Mm. So even a German company in Germany, their official documents are in English. So there mm, goes okay. for you to understand the the complexity of going through other languages. It's going to become something. I don't know. I know a lot of native speakers who are very lazy because everyone speaks English. Oh, native native speakers of English, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, and I mean, I don't blame them. I mean, I, I, I can't project my 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 motive. I, I like learning languages, um, I, but I can't project that on others. Um, but I can't blame them. I mean, if the whole world understands you, I, I think I think it sucks a bit because you can't speak privately. Like if you're commenting, if you if you're if you're in if you're in Germany or whatever, <laughs> and you want to speak with your with your mate in, in the streets. In English, and you only speak English. Everyone is going to understand you. You can't speak. Exactly. You can't speak ill of other people. I mean, no, I, I I can because I'm fairly certain that there's a very small percentage of people outside of Portugal that speaks Portuguese, and the chances of me finding a person that speaks Portuguese outside of Portugal, I mean, it's quite small. So I know that I maybe I can comment on something that I wouldn't otherwise. That's but, I mean, true. Yeah. And I, I I got busted once with my <laughs> wife. We were in Namibia. Mm. And in Namibia, they speak English, German, and mm. a lot of people come from the neighboring Angola. Oh, so yeah. we were sometimes around and we couldn't speak any language. There was yeah. no, nothing we could say. We just yeah. look at each other and was like, <laughs> yeah, guess we have to make something here. But let's go to the last one. Ashoka, yeah. do you have anything else you would like to say? A subject that we haven't talked about and something that you would uh, like to address? 
No, I, I think it was, they were very interesting questions, very interesting conversation. Um, yeah, I think you covered a lot of things. Yeah. It those is were, a lot of things. Those yeah. were those were good questions. Those were good questions. Yeah, yeah. I have I have to thank you. I have to thank my coworker here, Steven mm -hmm. Sabetti. Some of the mm -hmm. questions I stole from his uh, master thesis. <laughs> but, uh, well, I'm 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 giving it. Uh, so it's it's, it's, it's all all fair and square. Right, Jorge, thank you very much for participating on the Gustavo Bernanasi channel, and you're always welcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you.